The Garden of Happiness and Life. This audio story has been adapted from a classic for an easy listening experience. You can now listen in the background with your screen switched off. Please check the description below for details. Come outdoors, Mr. Lambert, come outdoors. I can't talk or think right with walls around me. Never could. Let's go out to the garden. These were almost the first words I heard Abel Armstrong say. I had never met him before that evening in May. He was a trustee at the school in Stillwater, and I was the new schoolmaster. I had gone down to discuss some school business. Stillwater was a rather lonely rural district. In all honesty, I was quite pleased about that. Life hadn't been going right for me. My heart was hurting over many things. I was glad that Stillwater offered me the time and opportunity for some healing. But looking back, I doubt if I could have found any, had it not been for Abel. Actually, had it not been for Abel, and his beloved garden. Abel Armstrong was always called Old Abel, though he was barely sixty. He lived in a delightful-looking house, close by the harbour shore. People in Stillwater called him, a bit unusual. But they still seemed to be very fond of him. He lived with his sister, Tamsin, who was about ten years older than him. Mrs. Campbell, my landlady, informed that Tamsin had not been of sound mind for many years. She was all right now, but only a bit quiet. When Abel was young, he had been to college. But it was only for a year. He had given it all up when Tamsin had her mental illness. There was no one else to look after her, so Abel took over her care without any complaint. Mrs. Campbell explained. Abel always took things easy. Oh yes, he did. Never seemed to worry over any disappointments as most people do. As long as Abel Armstrong can stride up and down that garden of his, talking to his cat as if it was human, he doesn't care over anything. His father was in business and did quite well. But the family didn't take much after him. They were all like their mother's side, all dreamy. It, I'm afraid, it just ain't the way to get on in this world. Of course, Mrs. Campbell was right. It was not the way to get on in this, material world. But there are other worlds where getting on is judged by different standards. Abel Armstrong lived in one of those worlds. A world that is far beyond the understanding of the farmers and the fishers. I sensed this even before meeting him. But that night in his garden, looking at the sky over the harbour, changing from a smoky red to dark blue with twinkling stars, I found a true friend. A friend whose personality was to calm, harmonise, and enrich my whole existence. This sketch is my tribute to one of the rarest and finest souls God ever created. Abel was a tall man, somewhat clumsy but with the friendliest of faces. He had the appearance of a man who had had many sorrows. Sorrows which had marked his body, as well as his soul. Looking at him, I doubted Mrs. Campbell's conclusion that giving up college had not bothered him. This man had given up a lot, and he had felt it deeply but he had then outlived that pain. We went out to the garden. The air was fragrant with a seaside scent. Abel opened the garden gate and we stepped in. The wooden gate was beautifully surrounded by white lilac flowers. From it, a small path led to a huge apple tree in the center. It was surrounded by a circular seat around its trunk. But Abel's favorite seat, he said, was lower down the slope. It was under a wooden arbor, overhung with an abundance of delicate flowers. He led me to it, and pointed proudly to the wonderful view of the harbor that was seen from the seat. The sunset glow had now faded out of the sky. The sea appeared silver, like a mirror. Sailboats drifted along by the darkening shore. A bell was ringing in a small chapel across the harbor. It created a dreamy feeling, chiming sweetly at dusk time chiming with the sound of the sea in the background. 
In the distance was a light house, and, from it, a great revolving light flashed against the dark sky. And even further out, one could see a passing steamer ship as it left a crinkled ribbon of grey smoke behind it. Abel exclaimed. Now. Isn't that view worth looking at? You don't even have to pay anything for it. All that sea and sky, all free. Free without the need for money and without price. Let's sit down here. There'll be a moonrise soon. I'm never tired of looking at how the moon shines over that sea. There's a surprise in it every time. I think you want to start talking about the school business. But don't do it. Nobody should talk business when expecting a moonrise. Not that I like talking of business at any time. I replied that, unfortunately, it has to be talked of sometimes. He agreed but went on to explain. Yes. It seems to be a necessary evil. But I know what business you come for, and we can settle it in no more than five minutes. Just after the moon's nicely up. I'll just agree to everything you and the other trustees want. Lord knows why they ever put me on the school board in the first place. Maybe it's because I'm so handsome. I reckon they wanted at least one board member to be good looking. He chuckled at his joke. A chuckle that was so full of amusement, but also so free from malice. A chuckle that was just so very infectious. I laughed as I sat down on the seat, and he carried on speaking. Now. There's no need to talk if you don't want to. I won't as well. We'll just sit here, and if we think of anything worthwhile to say, then we'll say it. Otherwise, we'll not. I have always believed. If you can sit in silence with a person for half an hour and feel comfortable, then that person can be your friend. If you can't, friends you'll never be. There's no need to waste time trying. Abel and I successfully passed the test of silence that evening. I found that I was strangely happy to just sit and think. Something I had not done in recent times. A peace, long forgotten to my turbulent soul, seemed to be coming back. In fact, that entire garden was full of it. Old Abel's personality radiated it. There just was nothing more peaceful than that seat under that floral arbor. I looked around and wondered of the charm in that magical spot. Far away from the madness of the busy world. Just then, as if he had heard my inner thoughts, Abel asked. Nice and far from the market, isn't it? No buying and selling here. Nothing was ever sold out of this garden. Tamsin has her vegetable plot there, but what we don't eat we give away. George Pendleton has a big garden like this down by the harbour. He sells heaps of flowers and fruits and vegetables to all the hotels. He thinks I'm a silly fool because I don't do the same. Well, he gets money out of his garden, and I get happiness out of mine. That's the difference. Let's suppose I could make more money. What then? I'd only be taking it from people that need it more. There's enough for Tamsin and me here. As for George, there isn't a more unhappy man on God's earth. Poor man. He's always boiling in a broth of trouble. But of course, he brews up most of it himself. But I reckon that doesn't make it any easier to bear. Have you ever sat in such a seat? I was to grow used to Abel's abrupt change of subject. I answered that I hadn't, and he carried on. Great place for dreaming. Being young, no doubt you dream a lot. Don't you? I answered rather bitterly that I was done with dreaming. To which, Abel replied. No you haven't. You may think you have. First thing you know, you'll be dreaming again. And thank the Lord for it. I ain't going to ask you what made you stop dreaming. But trust me, after a while, you'll begin again. Especially if you come to this garden, at least as much as I hope you will. It's full of dreams, all different kinds of dreams. You take your choice. Now, I favor dreams of adventures. I'm 61 and never do anything adventurous. Perhaps going out for fishing on a sunny day is the most excitement I ever get. But I still lust after adventures. I crave for excitements. Sometime I even dream that I'm an awful pirate. A bloodthirsty one. I burst out laughing. 
Tamsin, who was weeding at the far end, lifted her head looking sternly at us. She walked past into the house but did not look at or speak to us. She was reputed to be a bit shy. Behind her was a huge orange-colored cat. As she passed, the cat ran with big leaps towards us and jumped straight up to Abel's lap. He was gorgeous. Vivid green eyes and immense white paws. Abel introduced the cat as Captain Kidd, as if the cat had been a human being. Neither Captain Kidd nor I responded enthusiastically. Spotting my lack of interest, Abel said. I take it you don't like cats. I don't blame you. I wasn't fond of them either, until I found Captain Kidd. I saved his life. And when you've saved an animal's life, you're bound to love it. It's the next thing to giving life. There are some terrible people in the world. They come here in the summer and keep cats in their summer houses. They feed them with fish and milk, and dress them up with ribbons and collars. But after the summer's over, they go back to the city and leave the poor cats to starve or freeze. It makes my blood boil. One day last winter, I found a poor old mother cat. And lying against her were three little skinny kittens. Sadly, she had died trying to shelter them. Her arms were around them. It was a horrible sight, and I couldn't stop my tears. I carried those poor little kittens home. I fed them up, and I found good homes for them. I know the woman who left that cat. When she comes back this summer, I'm going to go down and give her some of my mind. It'll be a proper quarrel. But how I love to quarrel for a good cause. And what about Captain Kidd? I asked. Was he abandoned too? Abel replied. Yes, he was. I found him many years ago. It was a bitterly cold winter day and he was caught in the branches of a tree by his collar. He was almost starving. Good Lord, if you could have only seen his eyes. He was only a kitten, but he had been abandoned. He had managed to survive somehow in the wild, that is until he got hung up in the tree. When I loosened him up, he gave my hand such a pitiful swipe. He wasn't the proud prowler you see now. He was meek as Moses. That was nine years ago. His life has been long for a cat. He's a good companion, the captain. I would have actually expected you to have a dog, I said. You're right. I did have a dog once. Jasper. I loved him so much that when Jasper died, I couldn't bear the thought of ever getting another. He was my friend. He was my life. Captain's a good companion. But I loved Jasper. There isn't any evil in a good dog. That's why they are more lovable. But I'm damned if they are as interesting as cats. I laughed as I stood up, but I wished I could have stayed longer and talk. Do you have to leave so soon? And we haven't talked about the school business after all. What are those trustees up to? Not much. They just wanted me to ask you if you approved the purchase of a new stove. Tell them to put in a new stove, any kind of a new stove. And just get on with it. As for you, you're welcome to this garden at any time. If you're tired or lonely, or excited or angry, just come here and sit for a while. No man ever be mad if he sat down and looked at this view for ten minutes. If you feel like talking, I'll talk. And if you feel like thinking, I'll let you. I'm great at leaving folks alone. Oh, I think I'll come often. Maybe a bit too often for your liking. Not likely at all, it will never be too often. Not after we've watched a moonrise together. It's as good a test of compatibility as any I know. Come whenever you feel like. You're young and I'm old, but our souls are about the same age I reckon. We'll find lots to say to each other. Are you going straight home from here? Yes, I replied. Then I'm going to bother you to stop for a moment at Mary Bascom's house. Please give her this bouquet of my white lilac flowers. She loves them. She's very ill, isn't she? Oh yes. But the Bascoms are an unusual lot. She could either die in a month like her brother, or linger on for twenty years like her father. But long or short, white lilac flowers in spring are sweet. I'm going to send her a fresh bunch every day while they last. 
By the way, it's a beautiful night. I envy you, your walk home in the moonlight along that shore. Then why don't you come part of the way with me? No. Tam Sin never likes to be alone overnights. So I just take my moonlight walks in the garden. The moon's a great friend of mine. I've loved her ever since I can remember. Anyways, good night. Tell Mary the lilacs will last for a week at least. From that night, we were friends. We walked and talked, and also sat in silence, all together. Everyone in Stillwater thought it very strange that I should be friends with old Abel, as opposed to those of my age. Mrs. Campbell was quite worried over it. She thought that just like Abel, there was something unusual about me too. Birds of a feather, she said. I loved that old garden by the harbor. Even Abel could hardly have felt a deeper love for it. When I entered it and shut its gate behind me, it would shut out the world. Shut me out of those unpleasant memories. In its peace, my soul drained out the bitterness which had been filling and spoiling it. It grew normal and healthy again, of course aided also by Abel's wise words. He never preached, but he radiated courage and endurance. A frank acceptance of the hard things of life. As well as a cordial welcome of its pleasant things. He was the sanest soul I ever met. He neither minimized the bad, nor exaggerated the good. He was of the view that we should never be controlled by either. That pain should not depress us unduly, nor pleasure lure us into forgetfulness and sloth. Unknowingly, he made me realize that I had been a bit of a coward. I began to understand that my personal problems were not the most important things in the universe, even to me. In short, Abel taught me to laugh again. And when a man can laugh robustly, things are not going to go bad for him. Eventually, Tamsin forgot to be shy with me. She gave me a broad smile of welcome every time I came. But she rarely spoke to me. She spent all her spare time weeding the garden. She loved it as well as Abel did. One evening, we were watching the sunset. Abel said. I am very thankful Tamsin is so well. There was a time when she wasn't. I suppose you've heard of it. But for years now she has been able to look after herself. And so, if I depart on that last great adventure of death some of these days, she will not be left helpless. She is ten years older than you. It is likely she will go before you. Abel shook his head and stroked his smart beard. No, Tamsin will outlive me. She's got the Armstrong heart, from our father's side. And I have got mine from my mother's side. We don't live to be old, we go quick and easy. And I'm very glad for it. I'm not a coward, but the thought for waiting for death gives me such a sick feeling. I only mention it, so that someday when you hear that old Abel Armstrong has been found dead, you won't feel sorry. You remember that I in fact wanted it to be that way. Not that I'm tired of life, but death will be something of a change. I'm actually real curious about it all. I hate the thought of death, I said. Oh, you're young. The young always do. Death grows friendlier as we grow older. Not that one of us really wants to die. Summer passed through the garden. There were roses and lilies, and hollyhocks and bright yellow golden glows. But Abel liked the more tinted flowers. And there were some dark red hollyhocks which were his favorite. He would sit for hours looking at them. I found him so one afternoon at his usual favorite seat. He explained as we started our discussions. This color always has a soothing effect on me. Yellow excites a bit too much, reminds me of all the adventures I could have been through. I looked at that surge of golden glows down there today. I got all worked up and thought my life had been such a failure. But then I got me this hollyhock. I sat down here to look at it alone. When a man's alone, that's when he's most with God. He spoke to me through that hollyhock. It seemed to me that a man who's as happy as I am, a man who has got such a garden, he has made a real success of living indeed. I hope I'll be able to make as much of a success, I said sincerely. Oh, I wish you will do many things in your life. 
the things I would have, if I had the chance. It's in you to do them. Just set yourself and go ahead. I believe I can set my teeth and go ahead now. Thanks to you Mr. Armstrong, I said. I was heading straight for failure when I came here last spring. But you've changed my course. And I'm so glad for it. But I think my garden has done more than I did. It's wonderful what a garden can do for a man. Come, sit down here in this glorious Sunday. Let's enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. Let's just sit here in peace. We sat and soaked in the sun for a long while. Then Abel said abruptly, I have never said this to anyone before. But no one else sees the people I see in this garden. I see those who used to be here a long time ago. It was a lively place then. There were plenty of us and we were all very happy children. We threw laughter to and fro in this garden, like it was a ball. But now old Tamsin and old Abel are all that are left. He was silent a moment, looking at the ghosts from his memory. Phantoms that walked invisibly on those patchy walks, and peeked merrily through the swinging branches. Then he went on. Of all the people I see here, there are two that are more vivid and real than all the rest. First is my sister Alice. She died thirty years ago. She was so beautiful. You'd hardly believe that after looking at Tamsin and me, but it's true. We always called her Queen Alice. She had brown eyes and golden hair, just the color of that nasturtium bush there. She was our father's favorite. The night she was born, they didn't think my mother would live. Father walked this garden all night. And when they told him at sunrise that all was well, it was just under that old apple tree. He knelt down there and thanked the Lord. Alice was full of joy. This old garden was full of her laughs. She rarely walked, she either ran or she danced. She only lived twenty years, but nineteen of them were so happy that I've never pitied her over much. She had everything that makes life worth living. The laughs and the love, and at that last sorrow. It was James Milburn, her lover. It's thirty-one years since his ship sailed out of that harbour. Alice waved him goodbye from this very garden. But he never came back, and his ship was never heard of again. And when Alice gave up hope of his return, she died in the end of a broken heart. They say that there's no such thing. But there was nothing else wrong with Alice. She stood there every single day and watched the harbour. And when at last she gave up hope, life went away with it as well. I remember that day. She had watched until sunset. Then she turned away from the gate. Suddenly, all the unrest and despair had gone out of her eyes. There was a terrible peace in them. The peace of the dead. He will never come back now Abel, she said to me. In less than a week, she was dead. The others grieved, but I didn't. She had lived with enormous joy. She had loved with all her heart. My grief had been earlier, when I had walked through the garden in agony. In agony because I could not help her in her grief. But often, on these long warm summer afternoons. I seem to hear Alice's laughter all over this garden. Even though she's been dead so long. He lapsed into the realms of his memories. I did not disturb him. I just let him be. It was not until another day, that I learned of his other cherished memory. He spoke of it suddenly. We were sitting at our favorite seat, looking at the glimmering radiance of the September sea. Do you know how many of us are sitting here? Two in the flesh. But how many in spirit, I do not know, I answered. There is one other. It is the other of the two I spoke of when I told you about Alice. It's harder for me to speak of this one. Don't speak of it if it hurts you. But I want to. Do you know why I told you of Alice, and why I'm going to tell you of Maria? It's because I want someone to remember them. To think of them at least sometimes, even after I'm gone. I can't bear that their names should be forgotten. My older brother Alec was a sailor. On his last voyage to the West Indies, he married and brought home a Spanish girl. My father and mother didn't like their match. Maria was a foreigner and a Catholic, and differed from us in every way. But I never blamed Alec after I saw her. It wasn't that she was very pretty. She was small, dark, and so very pale. 
but she was very graceful, and there was a charm about her. A mighty potent charm. The women couldn't understand it. They wondered at Alex's infatuation for her. But I never did. 4. For I loved her too. From the very first time I saw her. Nobody ever knew it. Maria never even dreamed of it. But it's lasted me all my life. I never wanted to think of any other woman. She spoiled this man for any other woman. To love her was like drinking some rare wine. You'd never again have taste for any other drink. I think she was very happy the year that she spent here. She worshipped Alec. And I used to hate him for that. Oh, my heart had been so full of black thoughts at the time. But neither Alec nor Maria ever knew. And I'm thankful now that they were so happy. Alec made this favorite seat of ours and this arbor for Maria. At least he made the trellis. She had planted the flowers around it. She used to sit here most of the time in summer. I suppose that's why I like to sit here. Her eyes would be dreamy and far away. Far away until Alec would arrive. Oh, how that used to torture me. But now I like to remember it. And her pretty soft voice and little white hands. She died during childbirth after she had lived here for only a year. They buried her with her baby in the graveyard of that little chapel. The same chapel where the bells ring every evening. She used to like sitting here and listening to it. Alec lived a long life after her, but he never married again. And he's gone now too, so nobody remembers Maria but me. Abel lapsed into his memories again. A tryst with the past which I would not disturb. I thought he did not notice my departure. But as I opened the gate, he stood up and waved his hand. Three days later I went again to the old garden by the harbour shore. I could see lights on a distant boat. In the far west, the sunset made everything crimson and gold over the great harbour. The air was full of music. There was music from the wind, and music from the waves. And still another music from the distant bell at the chapel. The chapel where Maria slept. The garden was full of sweet fragrances and warm colors. The trees around it were tall and somber, like the priestly forms of some mystic band. Abel was sitting in his favorite seat, underneath the flowered arbor. Beside him was sleeping Captain Kidd. Abel was asleep too. His head was leaned against the trellis, and his eyes were shut. I reached the seat. Abel's eyes were closed but he wasn't sleeping. There was a strange and wise little smile on his lips, as if he had attained ultimate wisdom. As if he was now laughing at the blind suppositions of the world, and at its perplexities. Abel had indeed gone, on his last great adventure. We hoped you enjoyed listening to this story. There is so much suffering in the world. If you can, please consider donating to a good cause. Please check the link in the description below. Thanks for stopping by.